From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, the theater of the mind, dedicated to man's imagination. And today, on her birthday, dedicated to one of the show business greats of all times, Miss Sophie Tucker, starring in No Time for Heartaches, written and directed by Sam Pierce, with Margaret Whiting playing Sophie as a girl. I don't suppose it's ever happened to you, Miss Tucker, but... Well, I can't figure it out. What's that, honey? Well, I mean, well, I'm young, and, and people have told me I'm pretty. Or at least I'm kind of pretty. <laughs> and I've been singing ever since I was about five or six years old. But every time I get to You sit something, in your room at the Beverly Hills Hotel listening to the girl? You listen, and you look. And she is young. She is pretty. And you find it hard to concentrate on her story because it takes you back ten, twenty... 30, 40, 53 years to Sophie Abuser. It's a long way back, a long way back, Sophie, from this plush room in the svelte Beverly Hills Hotel. But the girl's voice pushes you back, and you wonder how it happened, how you got from there to here. You remember that first time you left your home in Hartford, Connecticut, with $100 in your pocket and a note to several of the top Tin Pan Alley songwriters from your friend, Willie Howard. You were young then, Sophie, and you knew you had it. You had it in you to be big in show business. But you were scared, too. And you had to take a deep breath before you knocked on the door, marked Harry Von Tilzer. It took two or three knocks to get an answer, but then it came. Yeah, come in. Mr. Von Tilzer, I'm a friend of Mr. Willie Howard's. Oh, fine, good. Oh, that Willie Howard, he kills me every time I see him work. He told me I should talk to you about a song. Song? What song? Wait till the sun shines, Nelly. Bird in a gilded cage. Both of those are good songs. I wrote them. Well, those are wonderful songs, Mr. Von Tilzer, but well, I meant I was to talk to you about singing a song. Well, I sing very badly. About me singing a song. About you singing it? <laughs> well, how do you like that? You're a singer. What are you saying? Well, I, I don't have any songs of my own, but I've sung some of yours in my mama's restaurant in Hartford, and Mr. Howard thought maybe if you heard me sing, you could help me get a job here in New York. Well, if Willie says you're good, who knows? I see, now what would be good for you? Uh... I know the one that people always like in Hartford, uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, fine song. Yeah, I liked it the minute I wrote it. Uh, how do you do it? Well, sort of, la da da dee dee Hey, good, fine, come on, let's try On a Sunday afternoon In the merry month of June Take a trip up the Hudson or down the bay Take a trolley No, no, I don't know about that song for you, honey It, it isn't quite right Well, I wasn't singing it the way I did No, I know the one Hey, try this one Mm-hmm. Right here, the, the words are here in the sheet music. I'm gonna afford to leave you. Well, you know when I go that I was the fella with the do do do. No, 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 that's not it. Yeah. Well, I, I used to sing Wait Till the Sun Shines, Nelly. Uh, that's one of yours, Mr. Von Tilsen. Yeah, but I don't think that's right for you either, honey. I'm, I tell you what, I'm kind of busy right now. I'll get my new songs into shape for a show. And after I get through with them, oh, in about uh, six months or so, you come on back and we'll see what we can find for you, huh? The thing that I really can't understand, Miss Tucker, is the way the studios always think they know what's best for you. I mean, well, like last week, I got a call from Paramount, and they had a part they wanted me to test for. And the minute I saw it, I knew it wasn't right for me. It was a kind of a stupid girl, not even pretty or anything, and she had to wear frumpy clothes, and I just couldn't do it, Miss Tucker. I wasn't right for the part. <laughs> Not right for the part. Not right for the part. Does that ring a bell? A kind of a sour bell at that. And yet, 
A bell that rang out the start for a lot of wonderful things for you, Sophie. You've been working at the German village, singing from 50 to 100 songs a night for a salary of $15 a week, and you know that you've got it. You know the folks like you. You also know you can't make big time singing 100 songs a night for $15 a week. Then some of the boys at the music publishing houses tell you about the amateur nights at the 125th Street Theater. And the next amateur night, you're lined up with 50 other girls and waited your turn to see the head man, Mr. Chris Brown. All right, girls, don't be in a hurry. Listen, we got all the time in the world. We'll get to every one of you before the night's over. Now, you, what's your name? Gladys Folly. What do you do? Oh, I act. I do imitations of people and birds. All and right, all... all right, Gladys. Let's hear something. Sure. This is an imitation of a bird. <laughs> That's a bird? Oh, sure. This is an imitation of a donkey. <laughs> uh, all right, all right, Gladys. All right, thank you. Next. I'm next. I know. What do you do? I sing. And my name is Sophie Tucker. I've got some songs here with me. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, try these three. Hey, Charlie, take these and play them for this girl here, will you? All right, Mr. Brown. Here they are, Mr. Charlie. Now, I do this first one sort of free on the verse, and then I hit it on the chorus. <laughs> You sang the three songs for Mr. Chris Brown, and he said you could work the amateur night, and you knew this was the really big break. All the producers and booking agents would be there, listening and looking, and your hopes go up like a kid's balloon. And then, when you're walking out of the theater, you hear Chris Brown's voice, and he's talking to his assistant, and you can't help hearing what he's saying or knowing he's saying it about you. All right, Eddie, uh, and look, that last one, the big one, she's so big and ugly, the crowd out front will razz her, so you better get some cork and black her up. <laughs> She'll kill him. So Eddie got the burnt cork and blacked you up, and you went out on a strange stage with the smell of cork in your nose and the sting of Chris Brown's words in your heart, and you sang everything you knew how to say. And they liked you. You're a hit. And you started an act that took many years to get away from. Sophie Tucker in blackface. But your blackface act did lead you to the second Ziegfeld Follies. You won't forget that one, will you, Sophie? You stopped the show. You held up the $40,000 closing production number for 40 minutes while they kept calling you back to sing another song. And when you walked off the stage a hit, you hear the star of the show in the manager's office and you learn something new, something you didn't know before. I will not have her in the show with me. I'm the star of the show and a singer. One singer's enough. I want her out of the show and that's final. Yes, you learned, Sophie, you've got to be good. But you've got to choose your time and place to be good in. Miss Tucker? Uh, Miss Tucker? Oh, I, I'm sorry, but I guess you weren't listening to what I was saying. <laughs> Forgive me, honey. I was listening. I was just sort of thinking of something else at the same time. Well, actually, I didn't mean to take up so much of your time when I came over today, but... Well, there's so much I don't understand about show business. A and you were in it for so long. <laughs> I'm still in it, child, very much so. Oh, oh, I didn't mean it that way, Miss Tucker. But we'll take this business of an agent always telling you what to do. I don't see why that's right. I'll bet you didn't always have some old agent telling you what you could or couldn't do. I mean, well, like yesterday, he told me that I was wrong about not taking... You look at the girl... She's sincere. She really means it. And you wonder how you can tell her what a good agent and friend can mean to any performer. And you remember the man who meant so much to your career, William Morris Sr., the boss. 
He gave you your first booking in Chicago at the American Music Hall. And you promised yourself to make the people like you. You went on number four out of 20 acts, and they wouldn't let you off. Virginia, I'm as lonesome as the lonesome pine. Say, I would give my soul. And later, Jack Late, the publicity man for the William Morris Circuit, spreads the word to the critics to come to the American Music Hall and hear the Merry Garden of Ragtime. And they came, didn't they, Sophie? Percy Hammond. Sophie Tucker's songs are not for parlor use, but they're certainly a success with the audience. Amy Leslie. Her songs are near to shocking, but Miss Tucker's fairness, her calm amiability, ready smile, and emphatic gestures carry her through, even without a bump. And Ashton Stevens in the Chicago Herald American. That was a piece, wasn't it, Sophie? And speaking of elephants and ladies, there's Sophie Tucker. If life were as large as Sophie Tucker, there would be room for all of us. I don't mind saying at once that Sophie Tucker is my headliner. Some of her songs are red, white, and blue, and some of them omit the red and white, but they are never quite dark navy blue. Rather, they are inclined to be evil only to the fellow who brings evil with him. If your heart is pure and your mind like the beautiful snow, you will have a lovely time while Miss Tucker is singing, but he only stays till Sunday. And I just couldn't make my feelings behave. Even less secular is the New York rag, Carrie, which becomes a syncopated Harry Carrie before Miss Tucker is finished with it. Miss Tucker can move an audience or a piano with equal address. Don't miss any of her. Yes, the critics came, and you learned one more thing about show business. It isn't always what they say, but the way they say it. They might laugh, and plenty of them did, but it's all right, as long as they're laughing with you. You know, Miss Tucker, my agent is always talking about what I should do. He even wants to tell me what kind of songs I should sing. Gosh, I know I have to sing things that people like, but I can't see where it makes such a big... You can hear the girl talking, and yet you can almost see the earnest face of your wonderful friend and maid for so many years, Molly. The way she looked and sounded that day in Chicago in another hotel room. Molly had named you Patsy because she said you always be the one to take it on the chin, the Patsy. Patsy? I don't understand something about you. I don't understand lots of things about me, Molly. I ain't fooling. I mean it. I've known you for a long time. Ever since the day I got tossed out of the Follies. Mm -hmm. And the only things I've ever tried to tell you were for your own good. Isn't that so, Patsy? Of course it is. Well, then, why is it that you won't listen to my friend's song? Your friend's song? What are you talking about? Patsy, I've been trying to get you to listen to me about my friend Shelton Brooks for two weeks now, and I never get further than the opening line when you think of something that has to be done right now, this minute. Honey, I don't ever remember hearing the name Shelton Brooks. Well, that's because you haven't waited for me to get to it before now. All right. You have a friend who wrote a song, and you want me to hear it. All right, Molly. Tell your friend I'll hear his song. You can tell him yourself, Patsy, because he's right outside the door. Come on in, Shell. Patsy, this is my friend Shelton Brooks. I guess you know Miss Tucker, Shell. Yeah, sure do. I caught your act at the theater, Miss Tucker, and it's really great. I <laughs> guess you hear that from everybody, though. Listen, I may hear it from time to time, but don't ever let that stop you from saying it. It's the kind of music any performer likes. Now, uh, Molly tells me you've written a song. Well, I have one that Molly thinks you might like. It's uh, kind of a fast, bright song, Miss Tucker, but uh, you're good with fast songs. Go ahead. It? Play it once the way you like it. I'll join in with you as you go. All right. Wait a minute. Stop just a second. Let's try it a little slower. Some of these days you miss me, honey. Some of these days you'll be so lonely You'll miss my hugging You're gonna miss my kissing 
you're gonna miss me, honey, when I'm far away. Yes, that's a day you'll never forget, isn't it, Sophie? The day you almost let the big one get away. You've sung it ever since, and you've sung it in almost every theater and club in the world. And it's still a great song, some of these days. A song with the promise that you've had locked up inside of you all your life. A song that helped make that promise come true for you, Sophie. Yes, you were going great, headlining a big time vulnerable houses, rolling up successes from coast to coast. And then you open up a letter one day from William Morris. You call him the boss. He tells you he sold your act to Risen Webbers for a four week contract. Risen Webbers, a restaurant, which is just how you started so long ago. And it makes you mad. But the boss tells you it'll be the start of something new for you. So you open at Rise Webbers and it starts a whole new era. After you've gone and left me crying, after you've gone, there's no denying. You'll feel blue, you'll feel sad. The list of names that played the room or came to have fun was a who's who of show business. Paul Whiteman, Abe Lyman, Guy Lombardo, Eddie Cantor, Al Jolson, Ruby Keeler, Ray Bolger, Ethel Berman, Ted Lewis. The list is endless. And as always, the boss was right. From the Sophie Tucker room at Rising Weber's restaurant, the idea spread and linked arms with the jazz era to become the nightclubs of the future. Miss Tucker... Miss Tucker, your doorbell's ringing. Uh, yes, yes, of course. C come in, come in. I have a message for you, Miss Tucker. Thank you, son, thanks. Thank you, Miss Tucker. Now, let me see. <laughs> oh, it's from my pianist, Ted Shapiro. You look at the familiar scrawled handwriting on the note, and you remember that time so very long ago when your regular pianist, Al Siegel, told you he was leaving. You were opening a new act the following week, and you called your pal Ruby Cowan and asked him who could play for you. And Ruby said he knew a fella. And he sent him over to see you at the hotel. He walked into the room, a tall, thin kid in horn-rimmed glasses looking solemn as an owl. I'll never forget it. Miss Tucker, I'm Ted Shapiro. Yes, come on in. I was expecting you. Mr. Cowan said you were looking for a pianist and... I worked with Eva Tangway, and I played for Wellington and Cross. Uh, they're a dance team. Well, the main thing is to get the feel of working with me. I never do the song the same way twice, but I like to feel free and easy with what I'm doing. I see. Well, uh, shall I try one here? Sure. Let's try this one. You worked with Ted that day for several hours, and as rehearsals went, this one was pretty bad. Poor Ted couldn't transpose, and you couldn't sing the original keys, but you told him to work out the routines, and you'd use them next week at the Jefferson Theater. Remember how it went, Sophie? You played the bill, and when you closed after a big week, you were in a hurry because you were leaving for London next week. You were just leaving the theater when he stopped you. Excuse me, Miss Tucker, but I wondered... Well, I sort of wondered if you were satisfied with my piano playing. I'll let you know later. You know something, Sophie? He's been playing for you for 37 years And you haven't told him yet And you know something else? I'll bet he has a pretty good idea of your answer 37 years is a long time to work with someone And a lot of things can happen in those years London Sleepless nights working with an English songwriter Changing the American words into English So the jokes would make sense And finally, the Kit Kat Club And the warmest welcome you've ever had anywhere It's a long ways from the Kit Kat Club in London 
to your first experience in Hollywood, Sophie. But you'll never forget it. You signed up to make a picture for Warner Brothers called Honky Tonk. And from the minute you read the first script to the day the finished picture folded, you had but one thought. This is a stinker. The only two things you got out of Honky Tonk were the $500 you bet Jack Warner it wouldn't play over two weeks in New York. And the letter you got from a fan in port ban Algiers. My dear Miss Tucker, I saw your beautiful self in the cinema play Honky Tonk, and I wish to tell you that I think you are the most beautiful lady I have ever seen. Your generous proportions appeal to me more than I can say. If you'll do me the honor to come to Algiers, I shall make you the favorite of my harem. I also have a pet monkey which I shall be honored to present to you, cordially, Sheikh Abel Ray. But you did come back years later, Sophie, and you made Broadway Melody at MGM with Eleanor Powell and Robert Taylor and a young, vaudeville girl by the name of Judy Garland. And to you, it wasn't the greatest picture of the year, but it helped you to forget Honky Tonk. And it taught you another lesson about show business, Sophie. Stay with what you know best, and you know vaudeville, and the club's better than anything. And you went back to the cabarets and the clubs, and you're playing them now. And when you look around and see all your friends at ringside tables, wherever you play, you know you're in the right business, Sophie. You know it for sure. Well, I, I didn't mean to take up so much of your time, Miss Tucker, and I guess I've done an awful lot of talking, but I've always wanted to meet you, and, and I knew you could help me. Honey, honey, I don't know whether I can help you or not. I've been asked for advice from people who became stars before you were born. Mama Dolly used to ask me what was good for her kids, the Dolly sisters they became. Harry Richmond's mom brought him to me when he was wearing short pants, and Minnie Marx and her boys, they became the four Marx brothers, and so many others. And I've told him the same thing I can tell you. Never be late. A headliner is always on time. Be sure you look right. You never know who you may meet. Never let down on a show and remember when you're on stage, you're in character. Don't ad lib. Don't be smart alecky. You may think you're being funny, but comedy doesn't come that easy. And be yourself. Don't be a carbon copy. And remember that first, last, and always, it's your work that counts. It isn't easy, and there's no time to be sick. Or to make any excuses. There's no time for heartaches. But if you make good in show business, it's something to be very proud of. It's well worth working for. And one thing more. One very important thing you must do. Take a look at yourself every day. You have heard the CBS Radio Workshop production of No Time for Heartaches, starring Miss Sophie Tucker, with Miss Margaret Whiting playing Sophie Tucker as a girl. No Time for Heartaches was written and directed in Hollywood by Sam Pierce and produced by William N. Robeson, with music by Paul Barron. Featured in the cast tonight were Norma Jean Nielsen, Hans Conried, Dawes Butler, June Foray, Jay Novello, Amanda Randolph, Roy Glenn, and Byron Kane. Tonight, on Face the Nation, the head of the British Labour Party, Hugh Gatesco, faces a battery of top-flight Washington correspondents to answer many of the questions that are uppermost in your mind today. For the inside track on opinion inside governing circles, don't miss Face the Nation when it comes your way on most of these same stations tonight. Now stay tuned for Suspense, which follows immediately on most of these same stations. <laughs>